So good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for everyone's time this Monday evening. Hopefully it will be very educational for you. So you're probably all wondering what the heck does EIT food mean? So EIT is the European Institute of Innovation and Technology and ABP and our fellow partners within this project are joint forces to 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 collaborate with farmers um, and educate them with different areas of technology about a EIT food. One of their missions is to is to deliver an ecosystem for solving complex societal ch challenges by deploying innovative solutions. There's four different areas within the IT, the innovation side, the educational side, the business creation and public engagement. And we're doing very much around the educational part of this project about educating farmers, upskilling them with technology and precision agriculture with the challenges that come around the corner. So within this group, Within EIT, it's obviously a multi-collaborative approach with very in various industries within that and acad academia coming together to prove the challenges that we're currently facing within agriculture and the wider sector. So one of the quick statements, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So we are very much teamed up with the following, pe the following teams in a minute to try and dispel and prove and improve ourselves from the ground up. So a couple, couple of the challenges that we're currently cha challenging part of EIT food and that we've been approached with. Feeding 10 billion by 2050 is a big on our agenda to try and to, 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 to get um, close to. There's 2 billion people that are overweight, 800 million are undernourished. 35% of our food is wasted. And it's a very fragmented supply chain, low consumer trust and trans and lack of transparency within that supply chain. So we're all teaming up to try and combat all these statements over the next few years. EIT started up back in 2017 and we've been part of it from the, from the kickoff and EIT FOF will focus on farmers. We've, this is our third year of running it. I'll quickly go into what we started off with back in 2018. So in 2018, we teamed up with Reading University, ourselves, Hockenheim and John Deere tractors. And we we came together to upskill and inform our farmers better. We did this by employing six graduates and they all had independent farmers, part of um, the ADP supply chain, where they were sort of um, mentors for our farmers, where we took them to various grassland workshops, we took them to live to deads. We took them into ABP ourselves to show them various grading. And we also did farm walks of grassland. And we also used technology like EID weigh weighing, using the ABP portal to upskill and trying to improve them. So within 2020, this is the group that we're with today and everybody that's on it. We've te teamed up ABP with Reading and Queen's University to um, work on the livestock and technology within that sector. John Deere and Hockenheim University are looking at the arable side, which we're linking into as well. And AIA, which is the Italian Breeders Association and the University of Turin are looking at the dairy sector in Italy. So what we're trying to do for this series are we're going to be holding six individual um, virtual roadshow events or virtual events over the next 12 weeks fortnightly to demonstrate best practice or maybe not best practice on farm for you as farmers to potentially upskill or use that technology at the best of your advantage. We have two ambassador farmers for this year and I'd like to introduce you to the first of our farmers which will be Sam Chesney. Sam, who runs a suckler and beef and sheep enterprise in the Ard Peninsula and is also well known as chairman of the Ulster Farmers Union. And secondly, we will hear from James Evans, a beef and sheep farmer from Shropshire and a former Farmers Weekly Award winner and also just appeared on Country File on BBC. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Sam to go through what we have been doing in the last couple of weeks. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much, James, for your, your kind welcome and invitation. It's a, a very poor, damp, miserly night here in Northern Ireland. No sunshine this evening. We'll have a look at this and see. This is sort of a, an overrun that the girls made here about 10 days ago. I'm Sam Chesney and I farm on the most easterly point in Northern Ireland, just south of Belfast on the Arch Peninsula. We produced 1150 kilos of live weight per hectare last year. Our stocking rates round about 3.4 livestock units per hectare and the only thing that's actually stopping us from increasing that is night weight derogation, which we're taking part in. So we're running around, around, shall I say, a round figure as it goes up and down about 130 uh, suckler cows to finish beef to finish. Um, along with that we have 100 breeding ewes to finish and also we have incorporated um, some blade calves. So at, at present we have uh, around about 100 blade calves on the farm. We have uh, Angus heifers on a, on a herbal lay to be finished and we've just um, received another consignment of blade calves at 12 weeks of age. So really we're trying to micromanage the farm we have here. We're paddock grazing our cows and calves. This is a batch of first calving heifers plus a few old cows that calved late or had problems with but these are all first calving heifers. We took part in on-farm research for 24 month calving so our heifers calve before 24 months. They're synchronised um, to an Aberdeen Angus bull and then our own Angus bull sweeps them. So we've had a synchronisation programme in, in place on this farm for six years now and this year we only did heifers but in previous years we've done all the cows we are very focused on figures so we're only using bulls that we do use in the top one percent for breeding value and calving and, and carcass gain we ultimately sell our bull beef to abp and we're averaging well over 60 percent kill out on our limousine um, cross bulls um, we've introduced to Charlie this last couple of years just to to mix up the, the spec a bit the grass here as you can see in this field um, has been down a long time, it's been down in 2004 and it's still one of the top performing fields we have. We're plate metering every week um, so we know exactly what we're producing. We like to put cows into a grazing sward about 2800 to, th to 3100. This field is such a field it is, uh, you can bring them back to within 14 days, it's a tremendous field, yet it's a P index of zero so we're having to add P to this field quite often. We're very conscious of the environmental impact we have here very concerned about the soil and the really, the really, you know, you can grow crops artificially, but on future farming support may depend on how we look after the land. So we're taking samples with the whole place, deep soil sample this year. Um, but also the other thing we're doing is we're taking um, grass samples, and you know our average grass sample has produced an ME of 12.1 over this last 10 months. Um, so you, you couldn't buy, you couldn't buy a concentrated meal with a 12.1 ME. Uh, and, a, and a protein approaching during 18 19 percent you just couldn't afford to buy it so graze grass is, is, is the best and uh, therefore you know you're when you're breeding cows you're breeding heifers you're looking for these animals that graze well and, and it's in their training when they're when they're young how well they graze paddocks a lot of we would sow a lot of tetraploid grasses with clovers and all our mixes but the tetraploid grasses really encourage the, the, the heifers in particular to, to graze right to the floor with the new batch of calves that are, that are here three weeks and um, they landed here on the 3rd of July average weight was 135 kilos I pay a standard price for the calf plus a, a wee bit more for per kilo over 120 kilos plus all the calves are double vaccinated for pneumonia they're done for uh, ringworm all the male calves are castrated so it's a win-win situation um, I own the calves but they're contracted back to ABP whenever I decide to finish them and they know exactly what I'm going to get paid for them and the reason for us going into the venture with ABP I like to say to some of the ABP guys um, they need me as much as I need them now um, because they have contracted the calves into their supply chain going forward in a year's time well I've also said that I like to invest in a successful company and then ABP are a very successful company um, throughout Europe, biggest processor in Europe. So I am investing in their success by supplying them calves that they have supplied to me. So it's a win-win situation I think. They're very focused on the environment as well. They're very focused on what, what their animals eat, farm safety, lots of initiatives. 
that I would back on my own, never mind back with another company. And the young guy over here, Arthur Callaghan, would buy the calves, he puts them into contract rearers who work for ABP and rear the calves, and then from there, um, they come to here. They rear as one batch, they stay in their batch, and they come here as a batch. So um, there's no social distancing with the blade calves. They know they're, 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 they're pen mates, and hopefully that whole system of being quiet and moved from place to place together stimulates a bit more their growth. We're aiming to get uh, between 0.5 and 0.8 kilos of live weight per day on these calves. The idea we have here is to try and get a, a check like a dairy farmer, try and get a check every month and this is one of the reasons why we've entered, entered, entered into these. We're hoping to get a few more later in the autumn, about nearly sort of uh, end of November. So these are blade finishing steers and they are 15 months old and the average weight is around 540 kilos. They range from 600 to, to 480. Um, so they're in for finishing now um, on 90 days. So hopefully we're just a carcass of around 350, 360 kilos and having them through our system before the, before the middle of the winter, which is sort of the middle of November. Um, we do tend to believe that it does take a bit of grain to put the right condition on finished beef animals. The last of the bulls were killed yesterday, with some of the bulls killing up to 66%, yeah, um, on average of well over 60% on all the bulls killed um, on this clover based diet. So to me, it's a win-win here. We're producing something that's very sustainable. We're not using any fertilizer. We're reducing our compaction in that part of the ground. We let it flower once a year, which attracts insects. Um, the biodiversity and sustainability of the red clover product to me ticks all the boxes. The varieties we have picked do well in this sort of soil conditions. Again, it's opening up the soil structure. It, it looks slightly higher than it is because of the high foliage. We've got red clover, white clover, um, a, per, a perennial ryegrass, plantain and chicory, and it's very palatable. They may select different plants to eat at different times. As you can see, the tetraploid ryegrass is, is many eaten first. But let me tell you, they will zip it down as far as you would let them zip it down. Another thing that we're investigating, we're not sure about this yet, is the antimintic properties of this. Um, this batch of cattle have not been dosed since they came out of the house in February time. Um, they're very clean, they're very shiny, they're doing very well. The live weight gains, we still haven't, we haven't had them weighed recently, so I can't really update you on the live weight gains. But on an eye, again, they're doing well. Um, they're, they're fleshed well, but again, they're easy flesh and type cattle. We here are producers that have the end product in, in view. We produce our product to a spec. We do understand that consumers don't want a steak this size, and they want them all uniform to fit on the wee plastic plate that goes into the supermarket. So we have to be wary of what, of what we're doing. We need a, a product that tastes well, looks well, and is the right size, and to that add, very important that we use some of the technology, especially weighing cattle regularly to see how they are performing. Also, uh, Chairman of the Beef and Lamb Committee and the Ulster Farmers Union here in Northern Ireland, things we've done in the past, we have um, been co-researcher with AFPE um, on synchronisation, what else was there? Uh, it was 24, 24 months calving, calving. And we're, we're a grass check member, we're a part of the innovation programme for herbal lays. We're, we're very keen to to look and develop new ideas and you know try them on farm and the most of the most of the ideas do work yeah we're involved with abp in a lot of things um, and we're delighted to be associated with them so it all adds up to money it's, it's not the pounds we're making here it's the pennies we're trying to save so we have lots of theories going forward and hopefully over the weeks we'll be able to discuss some of these theories on, on the webinar i'm open to questions i love to see people coming and having a chat because it's a bad day you don't learn something so thank you for taking your taking your time out to to watch my wee video. Um, I look forward to meeting you all very soon. So from the from the first part of the video, you heard that they were very focused on on figures, and we believe if you don't measure, you don't know. I said my live weight total live weight production on the farm last year was 1150 hectares some of that was from lamb but a thousand odd 1060 1070 was from beef so we're maximizing our output by a number of things by um, paddock grazing 
uh, rotational grazing, by rejuvenating swards, by stitching in uh, new grasses, um, by closely monitoring our soils. And we do believe that soil structure, and we'll hear from GM later, although he's a much massive, a massive farm compared to ours, we both agree on the same things, that um, soil and health, soil health and grass um, will be the profitable way for beef and sheep farmers to go down if they're ever going to survive. We grew 14 tonne of, of grass last year per hectare with a, a utilisation of 92%. Some of the some of the fields had a utilisation of 96%, but on average it was 92. And over the past 10 months, our average ME of the grass was 12.1, and accrued protein at 18%. So you can see the value you can take out of grass versus a concentrate. Now I'm not saying that concentrates should be forgotten about. Indeed, I, indeed, I'm a great believer that it takes concentrate to put that finish on on the cattle. If you can get them to, to grow well at grass, well, we believe that it's cost me 16 pence a kilo to put it on a grass. Um, the best cattle were over a pound a kilo in the house to an average of one pound 42. These are these are things that, that we keep measuring um, or plate measuring every week. We've got a farm map. You can see it in the background here. It's all marked out of where the good fields are, where the, the fields are low in P and K and pHs. Uh, and we keep a tight, tight watch on these things and why do we do that well if you live in northern ireland you'll, you'll understand that, that con acre which is a, a yearly let the prices are exuberant and we must get value for every acre we take on this yearly let the average grass growing in northern ireland is 4.4 tons per hectare and we are growing 14 so really you know we can afford to, to, to to pay slightly more as long as we can manage the, the pasture to our own benefit. Well, as I says in the slide, these are some of the blade heifers. These are 15 months old heifers in the slide, and they're grazing a herbal lay. We bought these in July last year, 12 weeks of age. That's what they were like this time last year. And we, we've grazed these to November, housed them, continued to give them a kilo of, of, of the mixture they were on, and then turned them out and sort of mid-February mid February, or even early February if possible. The blade steers are, are housed already. Um, they've been out 200 days and their average weight is 550 kilos. They range from 620 to, to 470. They are in the house now on a TMR and uh, we have hoped to finish those in around 360 kilos dead. Now, I've also been asked to speak a wee bit about the blade thing. Many years ago, when Richard Phelps started the blade operation, we headed off to to see one of the farms, uh, Louise Tudor, down in Shropshire, who was rearing all these calves. And I thought it was a very good idea then. But why do we add them to our portfolio? Well, the reason being that we have 130, 140 suckler cows, and to add another 100 cows to the system wasn't going to be viable. We needed more sheds, we needed more ground. So it was very easy to buy these small calves, uh, which ate very little the first year, and um, hopefully by the end of the second year, they'll not long, they'll no longer be here. I bought them on a price. When they came to the farm, they were all vaccinated, all castrated, done for ringworm as well. Um, the health issue was non-existent. There was there was no health issue at all. They came as a pen. They came as as, as reared mates, and they stayed as reared mates. Their social distancing, as I call it, was non-existent. Um, they knew each other from really from day 10, I would have thought, right through to finish. And therefore, going into the social social aspect of producing livestock for, for meat, this ticks a lot of boxes for the consumer, um, that, that, they have a, that they have a healthy lifestyle um, when, they're, when they're with us. Um, I'm also guaranteed a price when I'm finished with them, um, when, they, when they end up at, in ABP. I do say to some of the ABP guys, I know they're on, online here tonight, that they need me now as much as I need them because um, they have got these blade calves tailored into their chart for whenever whenever they go. So it's 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 nice to be part of a, a successful operation, and hopefully they will make profit. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure they will. Again, I said it, but we're very conscious of figures. We monitor the cost very very tightly, and I've actually got these blade calves all on a separate account package on my farm computer, so they know exactly what goes into it to the very dose of 30 pence. We know exactly what they make and we have to be more critical of our own farm businesses and how we manage a thing. As I say, we're using lots of things. We're using EID weighing of, of all the calves, EID tagged, 
um, we can weigh 100 an hour for your, for your new, we've uh, bought a new weighing crush system. So we're very, very keen on on figures and, and how they perf- how animals perform. I did say that in our soccer herd that we're only using bulls in the top 1%. When we do synchronize cattle, um, we're very conscious of what we use, but we've also bought some very exceptional stock bulls and with very, very high growth rates and AG calving and carcass gain. Carcass gain is most, the most important thing for us. Like we're expecting on average a carcass gain of, of one kilo of carcass per day. And again, to, to achieve that, they're, they need to be fed properly. And we've a, employed a, a nutritionist to make us a ration to do the job. And it, more or less it works, more or less. We also get the, the odd blip in the fly in the ointment, but more or less it, it's worked very well. Over the coming weeks, we're going to be touching on some of the bits and pieces that Sam has mentioned. But tonight is really the opportunity to, to introduce Sam and later James as well to you all. And we'll take a few questions now for you, Sam. We'll, we'll get into a wider discussion at the end, but we'll maybe take one or two slides. And that is from William Sherrod. And he's asking, Sam, if you see a place for once calved heifers using blade sourced heifers and then killing the heifer before 30 months. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good point. It would, it would have to be through the meat processor that they will allow that to happen. Present if, if an animal is produced to or ends up at slaughter with a, a, a calf registered against her, it no longer becomes a, a prime animal, I believe. I believe it becomes a cow, even though she's very young. And I know this does happen on the continent. A once calf heifer system um, could be very profitable. And yeah, it, it, it could work, but it would all boil down to what the processors would do with that cow because you know, ultimately, she, she she could she still be away before 30 months. You know, um, we have we have heifers here that maybe have lost a calf and they're they're still away before 30 months. We've another one in the chat function for you, Sam, asking what are your views on improving soil biology? Soil biology is is the big is the big question going forward in Northern Ireland. Our future support will depend on how we look after the soils. We are deep deep sampling our, our soils where you know we're, we're down 30 centimeters so we've got we've got you know exactly what trace elements we have we are sort of getting ourselves into a, a sort of a, a, a rotation and the rotation seems to be lay her an ordinary lay stubble turnips a sort of a brassica and then into a herbal lay and we have found the root structure and uh, we don't spread any slurry at all now on our uh, grazing platform we're only using farm every year on our grazing platform, the slurry would go up to the, up to the outer outer limits of the farm for silage. We're very keen to, to improve the, the amount of, of worms we have in our soil. And indeed, we've grown red clover here now for, for eight, 10 years. And that's really what we are finishing that consists of red clover and a blend and straw. The fields that, that we have grown red clover, the soil structure is, is fantastic, shall I say. And also, again, it incorporates, you know, when the, when the the red clover is in bloom and it's covered in insects. And again, people will think, oh, we're, we're pandering to um, the environmentalists. I'm afraid we're going to, we will be pandering to the environmentalists in the future. Another thing that, I, that I'm very passionate about here is tall hedges. I believe that um, well, an animal needs 2% of its body weight every day, but if it's a very, very cold night or a very, very wet day, you'll find them standing behind the hedge. If there's a hedge or electric wire, and that will reduce their intake to 1%. Well, if an animal is eating 1% of its body weight, it's not going to put any weight on. And especially in this part of the world where, you know, we're near the coast, it's not like sort of some parts of England, which would have a better climate maybe than we would have. I am encouraging animals to eat as much as they can. And even on a very warm day, we find them behind the hedges. We have increased our hedges, hedge height to about, about 10 feet around most fields. And we do manage, the, you know, where the animals are. But going back to the soil structure again, P and K, as phosphorus is, is the big bogeyman word over here, that we shouldn't be using that. And we have found that some of our really good fields do need P. And um, we're having to go on and put that on as a, on a, as a straight, actually. And some fantastic yields of, of grass, again, with an ME of over 12 and a crude protein approaching 20%. A tremendous, tremendous crop of grass. But the herbal layers will be, I think, the... The, the future grass that a lot of grazers will, will grow in the future. We I touched on it earlier that I, I do think that some of the herbal layers um, will have an anthematic property. We haven't dosed any of these heifers that were grazed this herbal lay now for, you know, since March. I don't, we haven't dosed any of them and they're very, very clean. And the soil structure 
is a second to none. We're we're digging small pits and we're fine. We're you know we're in eight ten inches. Um, it's lovely open soil. The water is free draining. Quite a few yeah. coming through, but we'll maybe save some of them for discussion. But just on the herbal lays, one final question: How do you find them with regards daily live weight gain? That is a question I can't answer exactly. To be to be truthful, we haven't weighed enough cattle to. To, to say that one way or the other, they're doing similar amounts to, to the ordinary lay, but the proviso is that you won't, you don't move them from herbal lays to perennial ryegrass and then back to herbal lays. We did that for a week and we had to move the cattle back again because they just wanted back to the herbal lays. So we were getting 1.3 on an, an ordinary perennial ryegrass um, with 450 kilo heifers, uh, something similar on the herbal lay. I'll maybe just stop questions there and we'll introduce our second farmer of the evening. We'll come back to maybe some of this once we've heard a bit more from James. Hello, my name is James Evans. I'm an organic farmer from Partridge Farm, Linley in Bishop's Castle. I'm sort of farm here with my family, I'm a fourth generation farmer. If I just show you the, the farm really in itself, it's 1,700 acres. In that we've got a, a quite a lot of hill land, some moorland here. All the purple on, on here is moorland. This is a very large wooded area. We go right up through the valley with a lot of permanent pasture and, and quite rough grazing. Probably got a 400 acre block here that was pretty much in, in arable that's now been turned into a paddock grazing system. So we planted you know, most of that down to herbal lays really. So it's slow but surely we're, we're putting a hot wire around all, all these fences and doing everything on probably one and two day moves really. We run this farm on a contract farming agreement where the owner supplies the land, the buildings and the livestock. And us as the contractors, we supply the machinery, the labour and the management and we have a profit share. It works extremely well. So we're running two bulls, doing 70 cows really. A lot of that is to ease my management really, so we don't have to as many groups of cattle because we do them on, on daily or two daily moves. But also what we're trying to do as well, we'll DNA test all the calves to try and find out who, who the daddy is. Because we're trying to work with that with the eating quality issue. We're trying to get marbling better uh, and we'll do some work on the eating quality as well. Okay, so we're farming about 1,750 acres here. We're probably running about 250 cows at the moment and 600 breeding ewes and also trying to focus on grass-based genetics as well. So the majority of this farm now has been put down to grass. It's about four years ago we, we made the decision to switch over to organic production. It's something the owners wanted to do. It's not something that I was particularly wanted to go down, but now we've gone down that route, I've had a complete change of mindset. And I think organic production not using any fertiliser or chemicals, actually managing my grass far better and we're seeing far better results. Okay, so here we've got a group of 24 month old, more mainly steers, there's a few heifers in here as well. These are, are being all fattened off grass, these have never had any cereals at all. So we've gone to a completely grass based system, A because we started supplying butchers and restaurants, some of these cattle are also going to ABP as well, so we're trying to get probably better. 350 kilo carcass, between 350 and 370 kilo carcass. The butchers prefer them slightly fattier, probably a, a 4L finish, you know, because that, that's what they want. They, they prefer it with a little bit more fat on. You know, grazing, grazing cattle like this, it's, it is isn't easy. The easiest thing to do would be to bring them in, feed them on grain in the shed, but actually the market's requiring 100% grass fed, so that's what we're trying to achieve. Okay, one thing that we've noticed when trying to graze the cattle, you know, we, we're all told in to sort of go in at sort of two and a half thousand kilos of dry matter and come out at 15 to 1700 in order to maximise grass growth. But with these animals, we're trying to get as much weight on them as possible, so we're not allowing them to clear it up. Uh, we're leaving the residuals quite high. They could probably be in here another day, but in order to get these animals finished, we're just letting them have the very best, moving them on daily moves trying to get the, as much weight on these cattle as possible. Okay, so the last few years we've started plate metering. It just means around, I go around the farm at the moment once a month. I probably should do it a lot more. So we just go into every th field and do 30 plonks and it tells us basically how much grass we've got in our field. Uh, basically it's telling us how much feed we've got on the farm at any one time. And also by doing it regularly you can project how much grass we will grow, how much grass we grew last year and just give us a guide about how much silage to make really.
So we've probably stopped using a lot of advice that we used to use in the past about feed, but what we're using more now is a lot more specialists about the grass we grow and the types and the, you know, and my, my expertise, I'm not great on varieties or anything like that. So it's far better to get people onto the farm that are experts rather than trying to, you know, do everything yourself. Yeah, we've planted a lot of herbal lays in the last few years and we started off with just a clover rye grass, chicory and plantain. But since we've grown that, we've realised we need to go more diverse and we started putting things like hairy vetch and bird's foot trefoil and far more chicory, plantain, yarrow, as much variety as we can. Purely, one of the reasons really is to, is to benefit the animals, give them a far more varied diet. Also soil health as well. One of the, the key things what we're trying to do is improve our soil quality, get these, these rooting depths a lot, lot deeper, um, act as natural aeration, and, you know, just generally improve the soil, because I think once we get healthy soils, we can get far healthier animals, and they can suck up a lot of the trace elements that are in the, in the soil. Okay, and what we've got here, we're just showing basically where our cattle crush and the ID, and where we record everything, so everything comes into the crush. The ID reader is just above the crush, it just takes a reading of the tag, puts it onto the system, and then the animal's weighed. I just press save weight, and it logs it all on the computer. And you know, if, we're, if if it's simple, it's easy. You tend to do it. I try and weigh the cattle probably every 30 days. Weighing cattle, when it's good news, it's really good fun. You want to do it more often. When it's telling you that it's not the right things, you think, oh, perhaps I won't weigh them as often. But when it's when it's good news, it's 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 quite an enjoyable thing, and it tells you what they're gaining, what they've gained since the last weighing session and it just you know helps us really to, to monitor if something perhaps needs worming why something isn't particularly growing well and you know it just makes the job pretty simple really we've got a spring and an autumn calving herd to have a year-round supply of beef for the restaurants and what, what we're trying to do really is just do everything off grass keep it low cost we, we sold our uh, feeder wagons we sold our straw choppers so we're we're trying to keep everything down to a minimum and I, and I think that's the, the way to make profitable beef is to strip out the costs but still retain a high level of production. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm farming on a 1700 acre contract farming agreement. For those who don't really know what a contract farming agreement is, is the owners supply the land, the buildings and the livestock. And then I, as a contractor, I supply the, the labour, the machinery, the management. All the costs go into a central bank account and then we have a profit share that comes out of it. It works extremely well and it works alongside our family farm of 900 acres. So we're, we're running about 400 stabilised sucker cows across the two units, probably at the moment running 600 clean ewes. I mean, my, my system is completely opposite to Sam in, in a lot of ways but actually we've got a lot of similarities in the sense that we're both trying to achieve and maximise our farms and farm them both to their maximum and get the most out of grass or albeit on different terrains and, and different different completely different types of farms really. Our, our farm ranges from a 400 acre block of, of lowland productive grasslands to a permanent pasture running up to quite a lot of moorland going up to 1400 feet so we, we've got a little bit of everything really but about three years ago the owners of the estate we had new owners on the estate they they bought the estate and they kind of challenged my farming model and in the past i was quite happy doing it conventionally we were still running the the sucker cows the stabilizers and taking everything everything through to finish doing bull beef 12 months you know the system was working extremely well selling everything as breeding females and, and selling breeding bulls as well they they decided they want to go organic and my first initial thought to that was oh hell because <laughs> my, my thoughts on organic farming was it was more of a lifestyle choice and it wasn't a real way to farm and probably anyone who was farming organically had another source of income to actually pay the bills. So I, I thought, well, either I've got to embrace it or they'll find someone else that will. So, uh, you know, after a lot of research, I realised that what I had got in my favour, I'd got scale and I'd got a lot of grass. And in order for this to work, I needed to reduce my costs, completely strip out all the costs and, and just focus heavily on grass. You know, I, I use a grazing consultant, James Daniels, Precision Grazing, and we, we put a grazing platform in. 
we put in nearly 200 acres of, of herbal lays and um yeah it's 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 been really really good ever since we're trying to finish everything off grass sold a feeder wagon the straw chopper and we've extended our winter grazing probably through to 10 months of, of the year now we housed for two months the year before last this year <laughs> we had an extremely wet time like like everyone else did and realized that yeah, it's all right having an extensive system and, and trying to outwinter and extend your grazing period, but you've got to have a plan B, C and D, I think, this year. So we, we housed, although we did keep all the young stock out all, all winter, and, and that, that was challenging, but on, on daily moves, it, it worked well. Yeah, so here, here we've got a group of bulling heifers and just first calf heifers. They're on some herbal lays being moved every other day at the moment and then we're just moving the water with them as well you can see there's a kiwi tech drag trough that we lay the pipes on the surface and we just have quick release couplings so it's really easy just to move the water and that's the key i think with not having a fixed grazing platform throughout the farm just having water pipes on the surface means that you know you can still paddock graze even the most challenging of areas that's something that's changed it and that's something that i couldn't really get my head round. how on earth was i going to start sort of paddock grazing permanent pastures huge areas with rivers running through them you know it's going to be quite a challenge but yeah we're we're doing it and we're we're flexible i, I don't paddock graze everything we've got a you can see behind um that picture there's a there's a large hill there's 250 acre hill there that we keep the carries on during the winter we keep them out there as long as possible and um yeah it, it saves a huge amount on on straw and, and, and silage and since we've adopted the more extensive system we've reduced our straw usage by 50 percent and our silage by 50 percent as well so it's that that's where the the savings are really yeah we don't we don't get the growth rates in the cattle because we're not feeding any grain but we, we try to develop a market to sell direct to restaurants uh shorten the supply chain and we're supplying restaurants and farm shops and still putting some through abp as well yes yeah, so, so really just just you know to answer you know probably questions although minor sam's system is different i i just see that previously i probably ignored grass because i'd got a large area I, I felt that i didn't need to manage it as well well obviously being organic and not using any fertilizer I, you know I, i'm paranoid about making enough silage having enough feed and just realizing that we're, we're actually growing more grass now organically than what we were doing previously just by managing it so much better you know it's been it's been a revelation just really so a very different setup there but also like james says working to the same goals as sam there if there's any questions, does anyone want to raise their hand specifically for James? Yeah, James, there's a question for me. Um, you talked about precision grazing. What sort of technology are you using and what sort of technology do you think could be coming around the corner that could be beneficial to, to us as suppliers? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we've been plate metering for sort of three years now. And to be honest, I my, my opinion of plate metering really used to be that something that, you know, a lot of dairy farmers did in between sort of breakfast and lunch because they had nothing else to do and it was a bit of a gimmick really but when, when we've really realized that you know our whole system is focused on the amount of forage we can grow and forward predictions so you know we, we're we're the moment we're, we're just going around the whole farm at least once a month on certain areas where we're doing it weekly you know and it is time consuming but the information that we're getting is, is so valuable, you know, and it, and it gives us scope. Like at the moment, just this week now, we're just doing our winter feed budget to see if I have made enough silage, if I can start shutting fields up already for, for deferred grazing throughout the winter. But actually what's quite exciting at the moment, we're taking part in a trial using satellite imagery as a company in Australia. We're basically measuring the graphs from a satellite. And actually we, we took a measurement last Thursday and, and they scan the satellites over it and it's amazing how accurate it is you know they were showing me pictures of the of the imagery and you can tell where where has been grazed where it hasn't and the measurements that they're producing is amazing and if if we can stop using you know the plate meter and, and use the satellite imagery it, you know it, it'll be fascinating and then obviously the next step will be to stop using electric fencing and using collars to use virtual fencing that will you know 
that the satellites will measure the, the amount of feed that you have on the farm and then the, the the collars will allow cattle to be moved you know without remotely sort of thing so that's the idea and you know it means that we can all stay in bed a little bit longer. We've just got um, another question in from Mike Parley and he's just asking what the key management changes you've made to increase grass production. Yeah, well, put, putting a lot more clover in, you know, and herbal lays, that's been probably the biggest change. I mean, a huge portion of the farm is still permanent pasture. And in, in dry times like we're having at the moment, it, that we haven't got huge growth. But actually on on the everything that we've reseeded, the, the herbal lays, the production we're getting from there, and actually in the dry times, the chicory and the plantain is, is growing phenomenally well. Where, where the ryegrass seems to suffer and that, you know, the clovers like a dry time. And it's made me realise we put another 80 acres of herbal lays in this time. We've gone even more diverse again and putting things like yarrow and uh, sanfoin and, and lots of birds for trefoil and, and lots of other things like that in just to, A, to try and add more diversity for, for the animals. Because, you know, since, since going organic, I'll probably look at things a little bit differently and realising that, you know, we, we took a lot of land out of arable, been plowing and power harrowed for 20, 30 years consistently. And although it grew fantastic grass and it looked great, the first thing the animals would do when they went into the field would graze the grass underneath all the hedgerows and then they'd start grazing the hedges and then they'd graze, you know, the herbal lay. And you could understand the cattle weren't doing, they weren't putting on weight. And we found that actually they didn't have any trace elements in it at all. You know, they were short of selenium and iodine and copper. It all comes back to, to soil health. And probably over the years, we, we destroyed the, the soil health. There's no bacteria in the soil. The roots were actually very shallow. I know it was a, a new reseed anyway, but it was very shallow. And, you know, there was very little trace elements in it. So that's one thing we probably have learned by going to an all grass based system is that we, we probably had to increase, in the short term anyway, in, increase supplementation of, of boluses and, and free access minerals. We've just got another question coming in from Jonathan Blair, asking if you're techno grazing swords during winter and how do the herbal lays stand up to winter grazing or is all deferred grazing on hill ground? Yeah, well, we haven't actually, yeah, I'm treating my, my herbal lays at the moment like prized possessions. So we, we don't try to risk risk those too much. But the win, out wintering grass, we've done some sort of two-year-old clover, you know, ryegrass swords. And I'll be honest with you, last year on a 30-acre flat field and I was moving fences and I was treading them in underwater and I, I did question what the what the hell I was doing and we had all our weanlings out there we had 90 weanlings on a daily move and each morning you'd go to them and it would be quite a mess and you'd move them on onto fresh pasture and they were quite happy they they you know they were still doing but it looked a mess but the biggest thing to me was because they're only on that patch for 24 hours although they'd messed up the, the surface the actual soil structure wasn't particularly damaged and after a few days more of rain, it, it washed the dirt off. And after a week, you could actually start to see wreath growth coming. And I had a, a new new lad start working for me in December. And I think he, he questioned what, what on earth I was doing. When we took some silage off that field at the beginning of May, he, he, he told me what he thought when he first arrived. And it just goes to show that, you know, by having a back fence and doing a daily move and moving the water so they're not tracking back to it act, with, a, with the right stock class you can probably get away with a lot more than what you think but what, what we're trying to do is put more infrastructure in in around the farm so we're we're probably going to limit our our grazing onto permanent pasture because you've got a lot better holding capacity and also where we've got a bit of a slope where it's a lot more free draining we've just got one more question on sort of changing tact a wee bit asking if you can expand on the use of dna profiling to seek to improve eating quality and who does your genotyping yeah, so at the moment we're we're, gen we're DNA tagging all, all the carbs just to basically because we want to know if they're carrying the, the pole gene, if they've got horns, and also if they're a red or a black carrier, if they're heterozygous or, or, or not. And then within that as well, you, we, we test parentage as well. But obviously, one thing I'm, I'm quite keen on, and I, I'm working alongside some butchers, is to try and improve on the eating quality. 
And if we can start finding the animals that actually eat the best and they marble the best, and we, we try and find that back to a certain line of cattle or understand what, what we've done with those and just try to identify that. And hopefully, you know, we can take the DNA of the meat and, and work that back to either a female line or a maternal line or a, a sire line and just try to improve things. I know we're not getting paid on it, you know, and that's another bugbear of mine that we don't get paid on eating quality and that's something I'd love to see and it's something I'm trying to develop myself to be honest but I I think it will come because there's definitely a market for high-end beef that that marbles and eats extremely well. I'm seeing James here a couple of questions asked earlier just to go back to them first of all the question what stocking rate are you running and how has it changed since you're gone organic? The stocking rate itself probably hasn't changed too much we we were fairly extensive anyway because of the hill ground and, and things like that but when people ask me what stocking rates i've got I, I can't really give them an answer because on on some some ground we've got a, a grazing platform that i, I run 9500 kilo steers on, on 70 acres all, all year round and then other parts of the farm on a 250 acre hill i've got 40 cows and calves so it's it's really extensive and intensive and and it's what i'm trying to do is just utilize and have a high stocking rate on on the most productive land and then also try to work within the parameters of our environmental requirements really we're in a hls scheme and then we're soon to be entering hopefully into a an elms the new elms trial you know which will be heavily focused on environmental factors and, that, and i think that that will be the key especially to farming suckler cows will be to, to try and find a system which works alongside which ticks all the boxes from the environmental point of view but also doesn't get in the way of successful management of suckler cattle as well. Okay, uh, going back to Sam, a question for you here. What is your nitrogen fertilizer policy on your rotational grazing? Have you got any grass in with your red clover and are, how long can you make it last? Okay, thank you, Jason. Going back to first the red clover this year or the last year was the first time it was just pure red clover, pure red clover. And we achieved last year 32 bales per acre. So we've just had our third cut. 10 days ago of red clover and it's already about six inches long again so that's solely kept for finishing cattle we had grass in with it before but we didn't we didn't didn't like it we only keep it in four years the fourth year we found a four years of four or five cuts the fourth year is just about as much as it can stand we'll get that out and put a herbal lay in nitrogen usage on our per we usually do usually about 25 units of nitrogen per hectare rotational grazing after each after it once a month so we're using 186 kilos of nitrogen per hectare over the over the grazing platform but I've another question and i'll go to sam first and then if you want to james drop in too uh, and asking do you routinely fecal worm count on your grazing cattle yes we use a long acting antibiotic and our, our oh, sorry <coughs> a long acting um, warmer on the, on the calves and we do them at housing Yes, we do monitor fecal air counts. And James, do you want to do, you do that yourself? Yeah, I mean, we don't do it ourselves. We, we, we take it to the vets, but something obviously being organic, we, we've stopped using ivermectins. And obviously, we, we, we're quite, you know, I, I never thought I'd hear myself saying this, but I, I, I start walking around the fields now checking for dung beetles. And, it, and it's something that we, we never saw before using ivermectins. And you know, we, we, you can still use a, a moxidectin, yeah. which, which which is a which is a great great wormer. And to me, it's more it's more of a powerful wormer, um, but it has less persistency in the dung. So yeah, so we, we're quite cute on trying to to keep up with the wormers. And in the past, where we do a, a routine housing dose, we you know we we don't do that anymore. We we, we do fecal egg counts, and although it's a hassle going out and collecting. The dung and everything like that, actually, the, the, the money we save is, is well worth it. And if I can save a pound here, here or two, it's, it's, it's quite worth it. OK, question again. We'll start with James and go back to Sam then. Where do you target your farmyard in year and at what time of year is it applied? We're, we're trying to put it on, on aftermaths, really. That's where we've been putting it, you know, in the, in the past, you know, because obviously that's our only source of fertilizer really apart from the dung that comes straight out the back of the animals we have got an arable block as well 
that we've recently taken over. So we will be trying to concentrate probably the, the farmyard manure back onto the arable block. But we, you know, one thing we've noticed, you know, we, we do most of our machinery work as contractors. And because we're keeping the cattle out so much longer, we, we don't have the, the farmyard manure like we used to do. So it's not as a big a problem getting rid of it throughout the winter as what it was. We target all our farmyard manure on our grazing platform. Um, and since we've, since we've done that and taken taken the slurry out of that area, and we've found much better soakage, um, less muddy, muddy, muddy patches in the fields, and we'll spread from the middle of July, because that's about the only time we'll get a real dry, well, maybe not this year, but a real dry piece of weather. And um, we will do half paddocks all over the farm. And again, it just makes the grass, stimulates the grass again, a wee bit of extra of nutrients, and it's not washed away with any rain that we're going to get in, at the end of either end of the year. Sure, go back to James. There's a wee question here just to follow up on the DNA you're talking about. Uh, can you expand on the use of DNA profiling you seek to seek to improve eating quality? Who does your genotyping? And as far as I was aware, most of this work has been done in the US and Australia, but is this applicable on UK cattle? Yeah, I mean, so we, we, we're doing it through that was the NMR through the stabiliser group. I mean, we haven't got as far as, as genotyping for, for marbling yet. You know, that that's something that I, I, I'm working on. And I've got a company hopefully help, helping out with that. It, it's I, I think DNA is the future, but it needs to be for it to become mainstream. It needs to become a lot cheaper. At the moment, we're paying about 25 quid a head. You know, you, you're doing that over all the animals it's it's a it's a it's a big cost and, and if you can't get it's like with anything if you can't get the cost back it's all very well knowing all this fantastic data but at the end of the day the beef price is the beef price and until we can get a premium for eating quality it's it's a difficult one to justify really but i think it's coming and i think as the more people that use dna profiling it will come down but it, it's yeah it needs to alter Okay, a question for you both. Are you selecting for feed conversion efficiency and is there any correlation between that and eating quality? Yeah, well, we're doing our best. We're not we're not providing st using stabilizers, so we haven't really got a uh, net feed efficiency. We're, we're buying bulls from the Limousin Society at present with a limited amount of data on net feed efficiency, but as a th something that definitely we will be looking at very shortly. Yeah, I mean, obviously, within the stabilised breed, they've, they've done a huge amount of work on, on net feed efficiency, you know, and it, and it goes to show that there, there can be a 15, 20 percent difference between something that, that is feed efficient and, and non-feed efficient, really. But what we're trying to do with a lot of our stuff, I'm, I'm a huge fan of EBVs. Don't get me wrong, we our, our breeding selection is heavily based on them. But since going to a 100 percent grass based system, I, I think, you know, EBVs need to evolve and actually an animal that performs really well on, you know, growth is, is usually those figures have come largely from feeding cereals and it can be a different type of animal that really performs well on grass. And, a, and I think a, a gra grass based EBV, a grass index wouldn't be too, too difficult to achieve if you're, if you're taking into account birth weights, mature cow weights and, and something novel such as, a, you know, a 600 day weight, you know, you, you would get animals that are achieving off grass without any cereal. So, you know, I, I think there's room for improvements. The last question I have for the moment then, hopefully we'll get another one or two, is are there any issues with bloat when feeding red clover? We haven't had that. I know people who have. We, we we have grazed white clover for for years. The silage and the red clover, no no bloat whatsoever. We have had layers that we have put in with a tetraploid grass, white clover and red clover, and we have had no problem. However, we've introduced them the cattle to this when they weren't that hungry and on a good day, not a cold wet night. And I have on occasion once put some cooking oil in the water trough. Uh, an old an old remedy just in case but no we haven't had any problem yeah i mean we, we've had a little little trouble in the past and it's like when you you know there is nothing more devastating when you go into a field and you see a you know an animal blown up and it's bloated and it drives you mad and i i think actually there's there's usually an underlying issue with, as well why that animal has blow and we, we lost two animals this year and it was just when we had it was warm in the day and then it was cold at night and, and whether an animal has a touch of pneumonia and then it, it stops the room working 
and then you, you know that's when things can happen also we, we've had instances in the past where it is bloat but i think it may have been complicated by clostridial disease as well so so now we're, we're pretty hot on on our clostridial vaccine and everything as a you know a 10 in one and we're, we're hot on the booster and then we boost them after six months and touch, touch wood we're, we're hopefully getting better at it but you know you live and learn but i think all things being equal if you don't move cattle when they're hungry onto clover that you should be fine and also people say to, to move you know not in the morning to move in the afternoon or to, to give them a meter first and, and let them fill up slowly before they, they gorge on it and things like that so the trouble is that every year is different. And if you lose one, you beat yourself up, self up over it. And you can never probably replicate that again, because if it's killed one, why isn't it killed all the others? You know, so it's uh, it's a tricky one, really. Last question here for James. And what age are you killing cattle off the herbal lace? Well, our, our target age for, for killing things is, is dictated by the butcher. And funny enough, he... he he wants older beef and he wants 24 month old beef because he he's got this thing that he's he older animals have more flavor and he wants you know high, highly fat animals so we're, we're trying to target everything to a, a 24 month old kill really so between 24 and 26 months we're not putting the cost through to them they're, they're spending two winters outside so we're not looking to gain huge growth within that period and then just just on their sort of summer you know before they're killed that's when we're looking to really put put the weight on and you know we're seeing that now in the steers that we're grazing now and killing at the moment at 24 25 months you know that they're putting on 1.8 two kilos a day off grass and a lot of that is compensatory don't get me wrong but you know my whole system is based on keeping that animal as cheaply as possible throughout its growing period and, and then maximizing its growth of, of grass you know before it's killed Whereas I am exactly the opposite, James. I'm killing, you know, my bulls are away under, well under 16. Ideally, um, I would like the facility to kill bulls under 12 months. I haven't just got that yet. For every day they're here on the farm, they're, they're costing money. And, and I believe that I could add another animal to, to, to make more money on that. So I'm looking for it to kill from 12 months to, to 18, 19 months is, is, is old enough. That's right. And that, that just shows that... The complicated thing of farming, Sam, it, it is that y y you've got to farm the farm that you've got in front of you. And, you know, if we were as intensely stocked as you were, like you say, every day counts. Whereas I, I'm looking at it from the, the opposite end of the spectrum and I'm just trying to, to raise beef as cheaply as possible and use the scale of the farm to reduce my costs. You know, and it, it's it just shows that, you know, there'll be people on here who agree with my system or probably more people who agree with your system, actually, Sam. But, you know, it's uh, it, it just shows you, you there's, there's no right or wrong way, really, is there? Well, I, I, I'm grazing as many cattle as I can to reduce my costs. So that's exactly, Jim, two different systems, but we've still got the end goal is to produce the product that the consumer wants. OK, I think that's the end of the questions. Um, thank you. I'd like to obviously thank James and to Sam very much for all of that. And this is obviously not the last we'll be hearing of them because they have put themselves up for six weeks of this, which is, is quite an ordeal. So we are we will have a series of six uh, uh, events, one a fortnight. So the next one is this day fortnight, the 24th of August, when we'll be looking at the subject of grasslands and optimizing beef productivity from grasslands. Other subjects we'll be discussing in future meetings will include farm animal welfare, net zero carbon beef farming, One Health, very much on the subject of reducing antimicrobial usage, and finally on eating quality. So we will send out, everyone who's on the list currently at this meeting, and I've got their email, we will be sending out an invitation to the further meetings. Uh, we're delighted, we've had over 60 at tonight's. Actually, we've just got two last minute questions here. Uh, one last minute question in terms of, yeah, it would be interesting to, I'll take it as a comment, the cost reduction between the two systems. So that, that's an interesting one. We'll we'll definitely have a think about that. So James, is there anything finally you want to finish off with? Uh, Draper, this is. No, I just want to sort of say thank you very much to to yourself, Jason and Gillian from Ag Research. I didn't mention you at the start. And thank you to James and Sam for doing a terrific job. So top, top job from the both of you and everybody that, that are fitted in there. It's there for, for, for everybody on the call. So some really interesting, you know, challenges and different systems we saw from James and Sam 
great to discuss them, great to talk about them and how they're combating those challenges that they're having um, currently on farm and, and, and the way forward. Thank you so much and thank you everybody for joining.